Life Center. Would you stand with us this morning? I'm so excited to be together this morning and to worship together. And it's good to be in the house of God today. Amen? We have lots to be thankful for. Struggling to get my headphones on here, but. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, let's worship.
praise you, God. Praise you, Lord. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies until all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no songs of deliverance we've been liberated from our bondage we're the sons and the daughters let us sing our freedom 
Jesus, we thank you for that reality this morning, Lord, that we are your children. God, that we are sons and daughters, God, because of the sacrifice of the cross. Because you died for us, Jesus, we can come into your presence freely, Lord, as sons and as daughters of the Most High God. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for this rich inheritance that you've given us, God. We choose to grab hold of that today. We choose to grab hold of the inheritance we have in you, rather the fear that the devil wants to throw our way, God, truly. Jesus, we wanna grab hold of the inheritance instead. God, would you help us grab hold of your truth, of your peace, of all the things that you give us, God, that we have access to because of the cross, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this. Lord, we thank you for your presence in this place, God. There is nowhere else we'd rather be, Jesus. Lord, it quenches our thirsty souls, Jesus, your presence, God. Lord, we love to sing your praise and to worship you, Jesus. There is nobody like you, Father. You are more than our brains can comprehend, God. And yet you, you desire our worship. You desire our hearts. So, Father, I pray that we would respond today and that we would give that to you, Jesus. You are worthy. You are worthy of all that we have today, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. No point of reference. He spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of light. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born in the vapor of your breath. If the stars were made to worship so I can see your heart in everything you've made. Every burning star a signal fire of grace. If creation sings your praises so
We're going to read together scripture. It's going to be on the screen. And read with me. It's found in Psalm 107, 1 through 9. And it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul, the hungry soul he fills with good things. And there's so much truth in that. Jesus, you fill our souls with good things. Oh Lord, we were wandering, but we were found. God, we were lost, but you found us. 
We are so thankful to you, Jesus, for the hope that you give us. Your word speaks truth. Your word guides us. Thank you, Jesus. Today we are full of thanks to you, Lord. You brought us here. God, you have done great works in our lives. May our entire lives bring you praise today. In your name, amen. You may be seated, at church. Amen. Happy Thanksgiving. I am thankful for this church. And I'm thankful for the word of God. And I'm thankful that in this moment right now, we can fill our cup from the fountain of living water, the source that will quench our thirst. And I'm thankful that through the work Jesus did on the cross, we are now triumphant over the enemy. And I'm thankful for all of you here. It's going to be a great Sunday. Thank you so much for being here. Um, If you're here for the first time, even if you're tuning in online for five minutes, you just stumbled across the link, we do not want to forget you, and we want to get to know you more. So please fill out an online Connect card. Just go to connect.lifecenter.org, fill it out. We would just love to connect with you, get to know you more, and it's also a great spot to leave prayer requests, And if you have any questions, that's also an amazing spot uh, to leave them. We're also very, very thankful for your giving. We're so thankful for your faithfulness through these tough times. Um, And we're even thankful, too, for the giving to our, our food drive. We're so thankful for that. And giving doesn't look the same right now. We're not handing around baskets, but there's still giving in the lobby and online. But through it all, you have been faithful, and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And a quick announcement for the people online, the food drive will keep going until 2 p.m. So if you're watching this from home and you have food items, non-perishable food items to donate, until 2 p.m. at all of our campuses, you can drop those off. You can put them in your trunk, drive up, pop the trunk, and we'll do all the heavy lifting. So you have no excuse, really. Uh, Okay, this is an exciting announcement. We're doing a water baptism service Sunday... November 8th, from 6 to 9, okay? Water baptism is huge. It's a declaration of your faith. It's an appeal to God for a good conscience. And it's a very amazing step for you to take if you haven't already. Okay, here's what makes this so amazing about the service, though. We're doing it in a wave pool, okay? (laughs) So we usually bring out, you know, the kiddie pool up here, and, and that's great. It's amazing, but... We can't do that right now. So now we're going to be renting Gloucester Splash Pool uh, on Sunday, November 8th from 6 to 9. And maybe we'll even turn the waves on when we're doing baptisms. I don't know. I'm going to talk to Pastor Jay and see, see what he says. You never know. That'd be kind of a fun aspect. So uh, also on uh, Sunday, November 1st, uh, we have a child dedication service. So if you have a child you like dedicated, sign up again online. Lastly, alpha groups. Starting next Monday, we have a whole bunch of new alpha groups starting. There's going to be a group for young adults, a group for couples, a group for men, and a group for women. If you haven't done alpha before, no matter where you are in your walk with the Lord, no matter how much you know about the Bible, if you haven't done it, I really highly recommend doing it. I've had the privilege of doing about three alpha groups, not leading them, but just being a part of them. And every single alpha session we had every meeting I learned something and it was always profound so I highly recommend go find a group you like myself and my amazing girlfriend Saxon Coyman are actually leading the young adults um, alpha group so if you're a young adult we'd love to see you there if I can sum up alpha in a sentence it is a structured yet very open conversation about what it means to follow Jesus and who Jesus is again Bring a friend, bring three friends, bring as many friends as you want. Literally, bring as many people as you want. It's perfect for a new believer. It's perfect for someone who just wants to find out a little bit more about faith and Jesus. Even if they know nothing, so much is to be learned there. So please watch the video. It'll give you a little more information on that. We share things every day. Things that are meaningful to us. That entertain. Inspire or challenge us. We share moments, good or bad, big or small. 
because what we share matters. We have the chance to share something incredible, the hope that has transformed our lives. And today, more than ever, people are searching for hope, for connection, for meaning. The life we've experienced in Jesus is available to our friends and neighbors, and it's easier to share than we might think. Over the next few weeks, we are running Alpha, an opportunity to share Jesus with friends, family, and colleagues in person or online. Each week, we'll connect with each other, watch a short video, and have time to discuss our thoughts and questions without needing to have all the answers. All it takes is a simple invitation. Share life, faith, hope, Jesus. Who will you invite? Well, that's awesome. Um, I want to take a moment on behalf of myself and Pastor Lori and our entire team uh, to wish each and every one of you, whether you're here or whether you're online, a really happy Thanksgiving. I want you to know, Life Center, that you are truly, um, it is the honor of our lives to love and to lead you. You're an extraordinary community, and we as an entire team want to honor you today and to say that we have nothing in our hearts but Thanksgiving for entrusting um, you into our care and then together how we care for one another uh, in good times and in tough times. And so we just want to take a moment to honor you and let you know how much we love you and how much of a privilege it is to bring leadership here. Equally to that, I think all of us should be praying uh, for each and every one who has had their life once again impacted uh, by things rolling back into stage two uh, to protect one another, yes, uh, but restaurants and gyms and everybody associated with everything that has been now pushed back once again to stage two. Um, let's together be praying. I know as a family, uh, Lori and I, we were due to have Lori's you know, family from St. Catharines. We're not doing that for Thanksgiving weekend. We are not getting together with my family um, this weekend. We're trying to honor everything so that we can see our case numbers come right back down. And so you know, let's continue to love our neighbor and love our neighbor well. Well, we're going to continue looking at what it is to be more like Jesus and living more like Jesus. And we're in this kind of like mini series within a series is really what we're in right now. And last week we looked at being offended, um, that every single one of us offend one another and we, have, we are offended. And that's just not because we want to, that's just because we're imperfect human beings. And then today though, we want to look at the path and the power of forgiveness. And I want to sandwich what I'm going to talk about today by looking at the life of Jesus. You know, as a minister, I've had a distinct honor and privilege to be uh, in hospital beds, uh, beside hospital beds, I should say, in homes when people are taking their last breath. Um, it's a sacred space that usually reserved for only the strictest of family, uh, but because sometimes of my position here at Life Center, I'm invited to pray last rites or just to minister to people. And I want you to know that I've never heard somebody talk about a sports score. I've never heard them ask for a stock update uh, with their final words. And their final words are often usually words of forgiveness. They're words of love, where people are saying the most important and meaningful things that they want to say and they want others to remember. And so Jesus, while he is dying, he, every single breath that he took with every word that he uttered took excruciating pain. And Jesus said these words while dying, Father, would you forgive them because they don't know what they're doing? Would you forgive them because they don't know what they're doing? Jesus' final words were not flippant. They were targeted. They were precise. And he spoke about the way of forgiveness. Not just they don't know what they're doing to me, they don't know what they're doing. An eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. They don't know what they're doing. This is not the way of love. The way of freedom doesn't look this way. It's not the way of violence. So Father, would you forgive them? Because they don't know what they're doing. The Apostle Paul then picks up, picks up on the heart of Jesus who taught about forgiveness and says in Colossians 3 verse 13, bearing with one another, and if you have a complaint, or in other words in Greek here, if you have an offense against another, forgive them, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. As the Lord has forgiven you, that is so important, so you must also forgive not you, not it's a good idea, not forgiveness is one of many paths. No, 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 no. As God has forgiven you, the only path to freedom, 
is forgiveness. There's no other way, Jesus is saying. And within Judaism, there was a, a number, a quantity, that if somebody offended you, if somebody wronged you, if somebody mistreated you um, three times, three times within Judaism under the law, three times was if somebody offends you or wrongs you or wounds you three times, if they do it three times, you are, commit, you are permitted and, and you are actually in, you know, engaged in the law to forgive them three times. But if they do it a fourth time, you have no obligation to forgive them. Okay, this was under Judaism. So one day, Peter, trying to impress Jesus, um, takes three and he adds three plus one. And he says to Jesus, thinking Jesus is going to be so impressed, he's, Peter says to Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? He knows the answer is within Judaism at that time under the law was three. And he says seven, thinking like, man, I've not just doubled it. I've doubled it and I've added one. I've so exceeded here every expectation. And he has. And Jesus turns to him and says, actually, no, it's not seven. It's 70 times seven. Now, here's what Jesus didn't say. Jesus didn't just say, ah, within Judaism, it was once three. Now it's 490. So every single one of you have a ledger and go one, two, three, four, 407. We're getting close. That's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is actually saying is there is no life found in any other path other than forgiveness. They all lead to death. This is what Jesus was saying. Peter, you don't know the destruction to your own soul of unforgiveness, nor do you grasp the heart of God. If you knew the heart of God, then you would not ask, is it three or it is seven? You would see something much greater and grander. You would see both the destruction of bitterness and, and resentment and unforgiveness. You would see that as such, as such a dangerous thing. It is not to be toyed with. It doesn't just sit idle in a soul. It multiplies. But also, Peter, you don't understand the heart of God. And after they have this whole, is it three, is it seven? And Jesus says, 70 times seven. Because he's a teacher, he steps into the moment and says, let me help them understand this. And here's the equivalency. He tells them a story about debt. And it's found in uh, Matthew chapter 18. And he, he essentially says there was someone who owed $6 billion. You heard that correctly, with a B. Somebody owed $6 billion and somebody owed $12,000. Now, $12,000 is nothing to sneeze at. If someone takes $12,000 from you, that's still significant. I use the word sneeze intentionally because I'm behind a sneeze bar, but forget it, okay? Um, it's nothing It's nothing to sneeze at, okay? $12,000. But in comparison to $6 billion, it's, it's just a little bit like, okay, we need to have some perspective here. And this is how Jesus, so again, he's not going to use the word $6 billion and 12000 but you now know what Jesus said. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. And when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents, $6 billion. And since he could not pay, nobody could other than if someone who had $6 billion, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. This still would not equate to $6 billion. But notice here in the story, the man has nothing left to give. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. Pause. He can't. This is the heart of the story that Jesus is saying. Even if the man gives everything, he has still fallen short of paying his debt. And out of pity for him, the master, or the word there, pity, is compassion out of love for him. The master of the servant released him and forgave the debt. What a forgiveness. But that same servant went out and he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii, $12,000. Not insignificant, but definitely not $6 billion. It says, seized him and he began to choke him, saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servants fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused. And he went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. Unforgiveness is always holding yourself and somebody else in a place of imprisonment. And when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then the master summoned and said to him, you wicked servant. I forgave you $6 billion. I forgave you all your debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, the master then delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father, now Jesus says, will do to every one of you if, and here's the word, if, it's conditional. We all get the choice. If you do not forgive your brother, if you don't forgive your sister from your heart, 
Jesus is saying here in this moment, once again, the same thing he said to Peter, the same thing Paul said to the church in Colossians, we don't, we underestimate the damage that unforgiveness and bitterness does to our own heart. We underestimate these things. The only pathway to freedom is the pathway of forgiveness. And forgiveness is the act of releasing to God the hurt, the harm, and the wounds caused by another. Forgiveness is the act of releasing the hurt, the harm, and the wounds caused by another. This is what forgiveness is. In all, Christian forgiveness, according to Jesus, is the same. No matter how you're wounded, it is the same process. But oh, Sorry, it is the same step, I should say, of forgiveness, but it is a different process, and that's what we want to work, work through today. So forgiveness, according to Jesus, is first, remember what the price that you have been forgiven of. It always starts there. On Thanksgiving weekend, gratitude fills our hearts, or should fill our hearts, when we understand that Jesus lived the life that we couldn't live, died the death that we deserved to give us the life in Christ that we're called to live. We all fall short. We can't repay God for what he has done. It is this gracious gift into our hearts, into our lives. So forgiveness does not start with your character or my character. It starts with the completeness of Christ. And we gaze longingly at what Jesus has done for us, and it gives us then the strength to begin to see others and see the situations in our lives differently. It doesn't diminish them at all, and that's what we want to talk about today. So it's remembering the price that Jesus paid to forgive us of our unforgivable debt. We then resist this lie that unforgiveness is going to birth anything in our lives other than death, hell, and destruction. It's going to birth only those things. And then we recognize what, what you and what others, and then ultimately what God alone can do. You have a part to play in forgiveness. The one who wounded you had a part to play in forgiveness more importantly, in, in reconciliation. And so last week when we spoke about offense, there was this question that should have started to rattle around your heart, which is how do we handle the different depths of wounding or being offended by one another? Because we talk about being offended, but there are different layers to offense. There are different levels of wounding. There are certain things that we shouldn't equate. We shouldn't, someone, when someone tells a story of wounding that is so profound, you can't then follow it up with the time you were cut off in traffic. That's, this is not honoring of the depth of what somebody else is speaking about. There are different levels to wounding. And so just I wanted to just kind of use them today in terms of a metaphor of water. And I want to first talk about puddle depth wrongs. You heard that correctly. Puddle depth wrongs, okay? Minor disagreements in relationships are puddle depth things all right, like I just said, someone cuts you off in traffic, you show up at a mall, you have your blinker, your ticker, whatever you want to call it on, and they just come in and swipe your spot. Um, you've been wronged, absolutely, but that's puddle depth stuff. Really, at the end of the day, go find another spot, right? It's, it's really, if you've got a healthy heart, healthy soul, look at no one should come to blows over that, okay? That's just unhealth in our own heart and our own society. And yes, you've been wronged. It shouldn't have happened. But at the end of the day, it's a parking spot. It's puddle depth. It's, it's neither here nor is there. So we have minor disagreements in relationships. Someone says, says something, you misunderstand it. Or someone says something rude or hurtful. Um, it doesn't damage your credibility, but it's puddle depth. It's just like, ah, I shouldn't have said that or I shouldn't have said it this way. And there's, you know, engage it. You can do this. It can happen online. It can happen behind your back in a, in a whole bunch of di different ways. But once again, puddle depth is really just that you release forgiveness. Hey, you know, I'm sorry that I said that. I'm sorry that I didn't actually, I said it, but you took it the wrong way. But regardless of how you took it, then I shouldn't have said it. I own it. I ask for forgiveness. You let it go and you move on, right? Puddle depth stuff. These are types of wounds and offenses all around our lives every single day. Shoot, I, thought, I told you I was going to pick up bread at the store and I forgot. Hey, I'm really sorry about that. I can go pick up bread again. And I just, it's over. I mean, it's not like you, you, know, you, you lie down in bread. I can't believe you forgot the bread. Like, I mean, well, there may be other issues here at play now. All right, just puddle depth stuff. Puddle depth stuff, again, it's, you don't need a special skill all right? Has anybody here by show of hands ever stepped in a puddle? Can I see your hands, please? Okay? Every single one of you, and those of you online, keep your hands up in the chat. Um, when you stepped in a puddle, there's not one of you that stepped in the puddle, and then immediately your next thought was, I don't know what to do. 
What do I do to extricate myself out of this very predicament? If you find yourself in said puddle, to extricate yourself out of said predicament, lift foot, take step, done, class. It's not difficult. This is not rocket science. Nobody has ever signed up for, how do I get out of a puddle? If you have, you need help. And I don't mean to offend you, but maybe you need to be offended because it's not really that hard. There you go. Like, that's it. That's it. Now, yes, you're going to have a soaker for the rest of the day. It's uncomfortable. You wish it didn't happen, but really, at the end of the day, give it a little bit of time, it's going to dry. These are puddle depth offenses. Someone cuts you off in traffic, all these things. Puddle depth. Puddle depth stuff. What's the step? Let it go. Father, I forgive them. Father, I bless them. Lord, bless them. You know, they can have the spot. You know, I forgive you for saying it that way. I, you know, forgive me for taking it that way. Just let it go. Just move on. This is puddle depth stuff. Puddle is you can see the boundaries, and you can also get to the bottom really, really quick, Okay. But then there are not puddle depth offenses. Now let's go one deeper and let's talk about pond depth offenses. Not puddle, pond. In a pond, you can still see the border of the entire pond, but you can't touch bottom really quick. So there's some depth to it. There's some greater depth. So this is not just like a misunderstanding. This is a major disagreement where you can't see eye to eye Again, you can still see the borders. I can still see the whole pond, but I can't see the bottom. I can't touch bottom. And if you find yourself in a pond, you know what you need? Is you need a special skill to get to the side of it. You need to learn how to swim. You need, you need to learn. A, you don't need to learn a special skill to get out of a puddle. Excuse me, one second. Don't worry. <laughs> Don't worry, I literally just sp swallowed spit the wrong way. That's all that happened there, okay? <laughs> like, literally. So you're in a, again, you're in a, you're, you're in a puddle, you just, no special skill. But if you're in a pond, there is special skill. You've got to learn how to swim. You've got to swim to the side to get out. When in major disagreements, when we can't see eye to eye, we have to learn how to forgive. We have to learn how to apologize. We have to learn how to not make it worse with one another. We have to learn how to take ownership for our side of the street. These are all skills that we have to learn when we're in this level of offense. The words of Jesus now don't change. The only pathway to freedom is forgiveness. But the process can be a little bit different. It's not just, ah, let it go. There's some effort required to actually find healing and reconciliation. Here's what I want. In Luke chapter 17, verses 3 to 5, Jesus gave some really powerful words. He said this, pay attention to yourself. What's the number one thing that you want to do in offense? Pay attention to somebody else. Yeah. Pay attention to your own heart. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. Shouldn't have done that. And if he repents, forgive him. If he repents. Notice it says, if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day, and he turns seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. It says, then the apostles said three words, increase our faith. So again, in puddle depth to pond depth, I want you to notice the same step is the step of forgiveness. But Jesus is now describing not puddle, he's describing something deeper here. And here's what he says, that you and I have relationships with people. And sometimes there are fences and there are things that happen in all of our lives, sometimes because we intend, sometimes because we're unhealthy, and sometimes it's not intentional at all, and it's due to our own unhealth, our own ignorance, our own not understanding, the pain that you were in. We say things, we just, we just misunderstand one another, all of these things. Now we're in some pain that has some depth to it. And Jesus says, not only is forgiveness essential here, but you gotta watch yourself. And your next step is not only forgiveness, it is repentance. Repentance is not merely saying sorry. Story. Repentance is saying, God, change the trajectory, change the direction of my life. So repentance literally in the scriptures mean I am walking this way, I stop, I receive forgiveness, I'm repentive, 
I turn and now I begin to walk this way. So I'm no longer going to walk in the same direction. I'm not going to have the same vain imaginations going over and over in my head. God, I'm going to turn in this place. And as Jesus said, if you're in relationship with somebody who is there repenting, that they're stopping, they're acknowledging, and then they're turning, then you must forgive them every single time, even if it's seven times. Keep forgiving them as long as they're in repentance because here's what's true. Every single one of us need three things in order to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. We need grace, we need truth, and we need time. God can supernaturally transform us, yes, but relationally we need grace, truth, and time. And so what is the step that we need here? In pawn depth, notice what the disciples and the apostles immediately said. Here's what they said. So in puddle depth, let it go. In pawn depth, here's what you need to pray. Lord, increase my faith. This is counterintuitive when you're in an offense. You need to pray, Lord, increase my faith. What is faith? Faith is eyes to see not only what is happening, but what God is doing. Lord, increase my faith. In offense, you know what you can't see? You can't see other than the more you're offended, all you can see is what the other person isn't doing. You, can't no longer see, you can no longer see what God is doing. So they pray a correct prayer. Lord, increase our faith. God, help us to see the way you see. Help us to feel the way that you feel. Lord, help us to see the situation, to see our lives, remembering that you have given us grace that we haven't earned. So I look there first, and then God, would you increase my faith for my brother or my sister who is, you know, wounding or done this. Increase my faith for me to be able to see you at work when I can't see you at work anymore. All I can see is what they're not. I can't see what they are. God, would you increase my faith? This is a very, very powerful powerful prayer. But eyes of faith, once again, allow you to see how you know, Jesus sees you, how sees others, the situation, and also increase my faith to see the work of the enemy all around me here. But also in love, and here's what I want to say with razor sharp clarity, in love, you also may, in pawn depth, you may also learn to set a boundary of love. That if someone between, between the wounding and the consistent wounding, if there is no repentance from them, then you may need a boundary in the relationship to separate you, not to divide you, but to separate you so that it actually, you don't destroy one another's. Like we talked about with the chairs, that's where the chairs get pushed further apart. Don't turn them away from one another, still face one another, but there can be boundaries that allow the Lord then to bring healing and wholeness and restoration. There may be someone else that needs to get involved in the relationship because you're so in it that you can't see it anymore. And someone from the outside needs to mediate, needs to begin to hear a little bit to bring people closer and closer and closer. So boundaries need to be engaged in this process. Again, not because we don't love one another, but in our wounding, we're going to continue to hurt one another. Hurt people, hurt people. Yeah. (laughs) In my life, here's what I know. I have had people say really horrible things to me. And then with love and boundaries, they affected the relationship. But given time, I have had people come back to me and say, you know what? What I said to you this had actually nothing to do with that. It had to do with something that happened over here. You were just the recipient of my pain. In my life, I have said things to people, to those that I love sometimes, They're just the recipient of things that really I didn't have the courage to say over here. And then with people I love, I'd said them over here. So sometimes we need boundaries to begin to heal, take steps. These are not things that are not found within the kingdom of God. It took, in the Old Testament, it took Joseph and his family 17 years for God to reconcile them. 17 years. In the New Testament, there are sharp disagreements between Paul and John Mark, and God uses both of them to continue to spread the gospel while their relationship is being restored. These things can happen simultaneously. But Jesus says again, if your brother sins against you, If they say, I repent, these are really important things. Healthy boundaries sometimes help give us grace and truth and a little bit of time for things to be healed. Now I want to switch to the final one today, which is, you know, I've done puddle, I've done pond, and I wish I had a P word here, but I don't, but it's ocean depth wounds. We'd have been a perfect alliteration of puddle, pond, 
an ocean. Somebody after the first service said, you could say Puddle Pond Pacific Ocean. <laughs> and I was like, as a pastor, which is another P word, now we're into the alliteration heaven. But now let's talk about ocean depth wrongs. Puddle, someone cuts you off, says something offensive, let it go. Forgiveness, get out. Pond, you need to learn a new skill. You need to learn how to apologize. You need to learn how to set a boundary. You need to learn how to, it's, it's the same path of forgiveness every time. Different skills, we need to learn how to do it. Now I want you to imagine that you are picked up and you are dropped in the center of the Pacific Ocean. Here's what I want to say. As you're dropped in the center of the Pacific Ocean, you're not going to be able to swim your way out of that one. Nope. That's not puddle. That's not pond. When you're dropped into the middle of the ocean, you can't see the border, nor can you get to the bottom. And there are levels of wounds. There are a level of offenses. There is levels of pain that people experience. Please hear me, followers of Christ. Do not give somebody the same process who is in ocean depth pain the same step as in puddle depth pain. Just let it go. No, no. When you're dropped into the middle of the ocean of pain, you don't need a new skill. You need rescue. You need saving. You need everything that heaven has, and you need healthy people in the body of Christ to come alongside and to bring rescue to your life. In an individual level, this can be, and I don't say this for any trigger warnings or anything, I'm trying to be very delicate and sensitive here. But you can all imagine ocean depth wounding where there's abuse or affairs and betrayals. In a nation, when we talk about residential schools, racial injustice, anti-Semitism, these are not puddle things. These things have depth and history. Again, what is dramatically different between pond and puddle and ocean is the dangers of the ocean are dramatically different from the dangers of the pond. Because in ocean depth pain, it isn't only the original offense. It is that our hearts can become enveloped in anger and resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness because what has happened is so unjust. What is happening is so unjust. The pathway of all three, Jesus says, is the same. This first step is the same. It is see what Jesus has forgiven you of. And then in your weakness, in your brokenness, and in your wounding, when I'm weak, that's when I'm at my strongest. If I have the courage to allow my heart to be saved by Christ. If I have the courage to allow wonderful, wonderful followers of Jesus around to speak into my life. Ocean depth wounds aren't meant for you to get over. They need God and they need others to carry you through. And I hope you understand the difference. It's not just get over it. It's allow God to get you through it. As David said in Psalm 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear. Why? Because you're with me. He didn't say, though I walk through the valley of death misunderstanding, though I walk through the valley of disagreement, he said, I am actually walking through the valley of death. And God, you're with me. You're the same God on the top of the mountain as you are in the deepest of valley. You are faithful and you are good. 
Jesus said in Luke 15, verses 4 to 5, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, doesn't leave the ninety-nine in open country and go after the one that's lost until he finds it? And listen to what Jesus says. When he has found the sheep that is lost, he doesn't make the sheep walk home. He gathers down as only a loving good shepherd can, and he picks up the sheep on his shoulder. Why? Because when the sheep is in ocean depth pain, it's not a skill the sheep has to yet learn. The sheep needs rescue. The sheep needs to be brought back home. And in being brought back home in the Father's house, then there can be steps of forgiveness. Then there can be steps of healing. Notice how Jesus rescues and then he begins the redemption process. He doesn't come to the sheep and list everything that they have done wrong, nor does he diminish or minimize it. Ocean depth wounds need a different path of healing. Same step of forgiveness, but we have to have a different path of healing. Trusted people to carry you on their shoulders, whether those we godly psychologists or pastors or Christian therapists or coaches or parents or friends, right? In ocean depth, we need outside intervention. We need salvation and we need healing. And I want to say this with absolute clarity. Needing help does not make you weak. It is honoring the depth to which you have been wounded. It is the same step of forgiveness, whether it is puddle, whether it is pond, or whether it is ocean, but it's an entirely different process that we have to have grace, truth, and time for God to heal. As I said to you, I wanted to start with the message of Jesus on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. And now I want to end here because there was another moment of forgiveness that Jesus had while dying on the cross. He had two thieves nailed on his left and nailed on his right. And one of those thieves turned to Jesus and he said these words, would you just remember me? When you enter into paradise, remember me. Remember me is not just like, it's literally, don't forget that in my dying breath, I am calling out to you for salvation. I'm calling out to you for hope. Remember me. And Jesus says out loud, today, you're going to be with me in paradise. Oh, the glorious gospel. But oh, how offensive the gospel is. So I want you to imagine this thief on the cross who has perhaps taken the entire life savings of the person standing out here. And they hear Jesus say, that person is going to be with you in paradise? Like, they deserve to die for what they've done. Once again, Jesus is showing there is no life in that road. The only life is this pathway of forgiveness. So reconciliation between the thief and Jesus, between us and God, is a finished work because of Christ, accessed through repentance. Anyone, whether you're online or here today, he's as close in as the mention of his name. Because the work of the cross is finished, it's done, any one of us can open up our heart anywhere, anytime. Forgive me cleanse me of my sin. I trust you for salvation. And in that moment, we are absolutely reconciled to God. But it doesn't mean that we're reconciled one to another. Because reconciliation between one another is not a finished work. It is an unfinished work that starts with forgiveness, but there are other steps that are necessary. And next week, we want to talk about the work of reconciliation And we also want to talk about the work of restitution. And there are some of you who are going to get to the end of your life and you are reconciled with the Father. But on earth, there will be no reconciliation this way. And I have a message of hope. I have a message of healing rooted in Christ for you next Sunday. You know, as ministers, we stand in the gap between what is and what could be. And as Pastor Lori announced last week, Pastor Rhonda is taking another step here at Life Center to be campus pastor at Overleans. And we saw it fitting to not only pray for her and install her into this position as minister here, but then the next step we want Pastor Rhonda to do today, and she'll lead it, is to pray for you if your heart is caught in unforgiveness. If you're here and that you need an increase of faith to forgive. 
then she is going to pray that God ministers to you, whether you're here or whether you're at home. Pastor Lori and Pastor Ron. Thank you so much. Well, church, I just want to invite you to join me in a moment. If you would stretch your hands as we just pray for Pastor Rhonda. And if you're joining us online, we just encourage you to stretch out your hands. We want to pray a word of blessing and a fresh and filling of the Holy Spirit as Pastor Rhonda steps into this new role. We're so excited. Father, thank you so much for what you are doing in our midst. We pray right now as a whole church community, as a church family, as we stretch our hands towards Pastor Rhonda. We pray for a fresh infilling of your Holy Spirit, that God, everything that you have established for her to walk in, God, you will give her what she needs to walk in it. Father, we pray for an increase, even in the spiritual giftings in her life. We pray for an increase in the spiritual gift of leadership over her life as she comes into this position to make decisions for the Orleans campus. God, you would give her wisdom. Father, we pray that you would anoint her eyes to be able to see people as you do. God, we pray you would anoint her ears to be able to hear your voice amidst the loud culture that we live in today. God, would you anoint her mouth and the words that she speaks. God, may they be your words. May she speak in grace and in truth. God, would you anoint her hands and the works that you have already established her to do. And would you anoint her feet as she goes where you've called her to go. Father, thank you for this moment. We thank you, God, for Pastor Rhonda. We thank you for such a time as this, as she steps into this, God. We thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Rhonda, we just invite you to pray for us today. What an honor to pray for you today. What an honor. Well, I want to invite you, if you would take that bold step, as Pastor Jason has just led us through an incredible message about forgiveness. If you feel that God has been tugging on your heart, that this is an area that he wants to release and increase your faith in, I would ask you to take that bold step and a courageous step to stand. We don't have a prayer team, so this is in lieu of a prayer team. If you would stand right now, right in this building, if you're like, God, I want to receive that increase of faith to release forgiveness supernaturally by God's power. Yes, thank you for standing. I know it takes a lot of courage to do that. And so this is really a supernatural act that you're doing to say, God, I am here. My heart is open. And those that are watching online, I want to encourage you to stand. And to say, yes, God, I am standing in that place to say, I need an increase of faith in this area in my life. And so let's just begin to pray into that. Father, I thank you that you've asked us to come boldly into the place of your throne room to receive grace and mercy in our time of need, as it talks about in Ephesians. So we boldly stand and say that we are in desperate need of you, of that increase of faith, something that only you can do by the power of the Spirit, the same power that raised Christ from the dead abides and lives within us so we thank you that this is a supernatural thing in our lives so we stand in this place to ask for this increase of faith to begin to release but first receive your forgiveness receive the work of grace in our lives so we can release forgiveness by the power of Jesus Christ and so God thank you that you are right now filling us with that increase of faith to be able to step into places and spaces in our heart to begin to have that healing work, that process to begin to release forgiveness in the name of Jesus. We thank you that it's not by might nor by power, but by your spirit. So we humbly come and we thank you that you are taking away our heart of stone and giving us a heart of flesh filled with your spirit. So we just come and humbly submit ourselves to you and to the work of your grace in our lives to be able to have that flow through our hearts. We love you, we need you, and we receive your grace to walk in that increase of faith. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Rhonda. Okay, well, are you ready to go? 
Are you recharged? Are you refueled? Are you filled afresh with the Holy Spirit today? I know that I am. And just as you prepare to leave today, I just want you to know how truly thankful we are for each and every one of you. It is a privilege and an honor to gather together. For those of you who have joined us online, we're so, so glad that you have joined us. Happy Thanksgiving. We hope you have a great rest of your day and you get a little bit of turkey, maybe today or tomorrow. God bless.